Well, good evening, comrades and friends. Um, when this talk was first conceived <laughs> last week, the main focus was going to be on the Olympics and the social issues behind the Olympics. And I wrote a commentary about it that's in this um, issue of the paper that came out today. So I'm going to be just sort of running through a lot of the, the different um, issues that came up during the Olympics. But in light of what happened uh, last Friday when Colin uh, Kaepernick was when when it was noticed that he was sitting on the bench during this, the um, the national anthem, uh, it really just blew up all over, you know, in terms of social media, and of course just in, in general, both national and international attention. Um, so. I want to focus a lot of attention on that situation because it's a living, it's an ongoing uh, situation um, that's brought up a lot, of, a lot of issues and questions. But both this development, the Colin Kaepernick development, and what happened at the Olympics a few weeks ago are intertwined, not only because they involve sports, but that these events transcend sports you know, in terms of skills and athletics and so forth, because we can use them to generalize on various forms of class oppression, with the central oppression being national oppression and racism. But there are also other special oppressions, like women's oppression and LGBT, LGBTQ oppression, uh, which we can apply to so much that has happened, that happened in Rio, and hopefully we can share some of those uh, experiences and discussions, because I can't raise everything. It, it happened over a two-week period. So I just wanted to raise just a few of the things that happened at the Rio's, uh, Rio Olympics, um, just to remind people. Because for two weeks in August, really the majority of the world's people, and that's three point, it's an estimated 3.5 billion people uh, watch some part of the Olympics, even if it was just one minute, whether it was on TV um, or whether it was um, being streamed on the internet. And a lot of the things that were happening at the Olympics, um, of course, we saw astonishing skills and, and so forth, amazing athletes. There were over 11,000 athletes from over 200 countries that participated, you know, in the Olympics. Of course, there was a lot of focus on the athletes from the imperialist, rich capitalist countries as opposed to the more developed countries. Um, so along with that was the bourgeois propaganda that really reinforced day in, day out, night in, night out, the double standard separating people of color women and transgender athletes from white male athletes. <laughs> For instance, in the opening uh, ceremony, where you know you have all the you know, uh, countries and their athletes marching into the stadium, uh, the commentator Meredith Vieira, who now works for NBC, she actually stated, which was just outrageous, that the Portuguese, quote, immigrated to Brazil. Of course, she failed to mention that the Portuguese brought the slave trade to Brazil, which resulted in Brazil becoming home to the largest African diaspora in the world. And we know, of course, most of the African people live on the continent. Vieira went further by using the racist terminology, quote, cultural cannibals, end quote, when referring to Brazilians who perform music that is heavily influenced by their African roots. Another example, Gabby Douglas from the U.S., who during the London Olympics in 2012 had won the gold medal as the best individual all-around gymnast, was horribly ridiculed on Twitter for not placing her hand over her heart when the national anthem was played, after she and her teammates won the all-around team gold medal in Rio. Douglas, who was African-American, was so inundated with 
with in terms of social media being criticized and ostracized and, and so forth, we're not being patriotic enough, quote unquote, that she felt compelled to apologize for this. Now, counter that with what Colin Kaepernick is doing today. Um, she also faced a sexist backlash for not wearing her hair in a certain manner and not smiling enough. This, is, this goes along with the deep, you know, sexist view of young women athletes, and especially if they're, you know, women athletes of color. And she actually left the Rio, um, she left Rio before the closing ceremony. The rest of her teammates were there, but she had already left. Now compare her treatment to that of Ryan Lochte. This is the white gold medal swimmer, winning swimmer, who was caught lying to the Brazilian government claiming to be the victim, he and his teammates, they claimed to be victims of an armed robbery, when in fact, all of them had been intoxicated and helped destroy a gas station bathroom. <laughs> now, Lochte had already left the country, um, and he was initially treated with kid gloves. The 32-year-old was described as a, quote, kid who deserved a, quote, break. A far cry from how 20-year-old Douglas was treated. John Miller, an, an NBC Olympics chief marketing officer stated, quote, this really caused an uproar. The people who watch the Olympics are not particularly sports fans. More women watch the games than men, and for the women, they're far less interested in the result and more interested in the journey. It's sort of like the ultimate reality show and mini series wrapped up into one." End quote. When Simone Manuel became the first African-American woman to win a gold medal in swimming ever, the original headline in the Mercury News did not even mention her name. It read, Michael Phelps shares historic night with African-American. End quote. And this caused such an uproar that the news had to issue, they were forced to issue an apology to Manuel, who, by the way, spoke out against police brutality after her victory. A 99-pound gymnast from Mexico, Alexa Moreno, was accused of, quote, being too fat. The spouse of the Hungarian gold medal winning swimmer, Katina Husu, was, quote, given credit, her husband was given credit for her victory. Bronze medal winner for trap, you can't make this stuff up, you know, it's just. <laughs> Bronze medal winner for trap shooting, Corey Cogdell Urane was described in the Chicago Tribune as the, quote, wife of, the bear, of a Bears lineman. That's the Chicago Bears lineman. That was her, you know. The achievements of the multi-gold medal winners like gymnast Simone Biles and swimmer Katie Ledecky were also denigrated. Biles was described as the, quote, next Michael Phelps, end quote, and the next Usain Bolt, end quote. Her response to this on Twitter was, I am the first Simone Biles, end quote. <laughs> NBC commentator Rowdy Gaines stated that Ledecky was so good that, quote, some people say she swims like a man, end quote. And Ryan Lochte said that Ledecky has, quote, strokes like a guy, end quote. Now, one of the most outrageous, that's outrageous enough, but what happened to the, the brilliant South African uh, runner, Castor Semenya, who won the 800 meter track and field race, she faced racism and transphobia in Rio. Semenya, a black woman, has faced bigoted scrutiny for the past seven years on the part of the International Association of Athletics Fen of Federations, which have questioned whether she can compete as a woman due to a genetic condition known as hypo androgenism, which gives her a raised testosterone level. Even though she won the gold medal, the IAAF is still investigating her, 
which has led to a certain level of racist and sexist scrutiny on the part of other athletes. For instance, when she attempted to congratulate two of her white competitors, Melissa Bishop of Canada and Lindsay Sharp of Great Britain, they completely ignored her. You have to see this picture of what happened. She came up and put her hands on their shoulders and they didn't even look at her. It was just, the Huffington Post had a great article about you know the, the bigotry that was shown towards her and show this big picture. And then one of the Polish uh, runners who finished fifth stated, quote, I'm glad I'm the first European, the second white. And Semenya responded, it is not about discriminating against people and looking at people in terms of how they look, how they speak, and how they run. It's not about being masculine. It's about sports, end quote. Um, so these are just some of the examples of what happened at the Olympics, and hopefully comments can, sh can share more, because it's what happened to Leslie Jones, the actor, the black uh, uh, woman actor who was there cheering on the US athletes, and, sh and she was just horribly um, attacked on social media. They showed you know, un uncompromising photos of her, the racism, you know, others can go into that, but we're going to write, you know, write about that. Um, now I just want to move on to, to Colin uh, Kaepernick and the individual protest that he's been carrying out against the playing of the national uh, anthem, really since a August 10th. This is not the first time he's done this. This is the third time he's done it. He started it on August 10th. And tonight there's a game in San Diego they're playing the Chargers. He is the um, he's the main quarterback, and in San Diego, which is one home to one of the largest military installations in this in the country, they have a salute to the military night, which is tonight. So we have to see what happens there. There's been some talk about you know people there supporting him, passing out leaflets. We'll see what happens. Um, So you've already heard from Colin in terms of his, how he viewed the motivation for what, what he's doing, what he, you know, why he's doing what he's doing. I just want to give you a little background information on him um, for those who don't follow sports. Uh, he has been a professional quarterback in the most popular sports league in the United States, which is the National Football League, for the past six years. He took the 49ers to the Super Bowl in 2013, and he just missed taking the 49ers to the Super Bowl the following year, 2014. He has made millions of dollars as a player and also for endorsements. In this country, while athletes are viewed as heroes and icons, in fact, athletes are probably more popular than the President of the United States. I mean, frankly, and other politicians. That's just how they're viewed. Uh, in you know, under a culture like the United States. They are well-paid entertainers, but they're expected to be non-controversial when it comes to certain social issues. Colin is following in the heroic footsteps of a number of athletes who decided to not only speak, but also act on their beliefs, like Muhammad Ali, and Tommy Smith, John Carlos, and Tony Smith Thompson, who also turned her back on the flag as a college basketball player to protest the Iraq War in 2003. And she wrote a beautiful open letter to Colin Kaepernick that we have up online. Comrade should really, and friends should read that. It's really, it's, it's, it'll bring tears to your eyes. You know, it's really beautiful. Um, such strong solidarity with him. Colin was born in Milwaukee to an African American father and a white mother. He was adopted by a white couple where he got his last name. And when I looked up, I, you know, I started following him on Twitter after all this happened. And, and so you're able to go back to all the different tweets to see the progression, you know, of why he's come to this particular uh, juncture. And you'll be very interesting, interested to know what came up. First of all, there are a lot of children 
in his tweets. He runs a camp. He runs a camp for children. And it's just millions of photos of him with children and, you know, them smiling at him and him smiling at, you know, um, and so forth. Um, and of all nationalities, ages, and so forth. But there are also lots of tweets echo echoing quotes from Dr. King, and not just the, the well-known quotes, you know, I have a dream and, you know, all that, that. but really it's it, showing the, the radicalization of Dr. King, you know, talking, linking poverty with the immorality of war, etc. There are a lot of Malcolm X quotes, as you can imagine, and photos on the anniversary of his assassination and birth. And then there are the tweets about Nat Turner and the rebellion against slavery that led to his execution. But more than anything else in terms of the tweets that you'll find uh, in his account is about racist oppression, especially police brutality. And even before the tweet about Alton Sterling's vi uh, videotape murder made national news when Colin uh, Kaepernick, there was a you know, number of athletes that came out you know, when Alton Sterling and Philando Castile were, were murdered by the police. But it was only Colin, as far as I know, who called them lynchings. He says these are modern day lynchings. Um, he used that, that word. Uh, his tweets also include the police murders of Sandra Bland um, and, and others. Um, one of the tweets that really stood out to me was an interview with a distraught 10 year old black child who was terrorized by police in Newark, New Jersey earlier this year. Th apparently the, the police just drew guns on this 10 year old child. And it's about a minute long video, but it is so shocking. I mean, and just heartbreaking to see what this boy, you know, what he went through. He could hardly speak. They were trying to get him to explain, but he, he, he just couldn't do it. Um, also, I don't know how many people know Sean King, the, the wonderful writer for the New York Daily News, who writes these incredible columns about police brutality. He actually came out and said he, he will never stand for the, you know, the national anthem again with what he knows. Anyway, Colin Kaepernick follows him a lot. And um, so anyway, and uh, King, uh, Sean King tweets out a lot, retweets a lot of his, his stuff out as well. Um, in all of the descriptions about Colin's actions, those for and against his actions, everyone kind of says, well, this was a personal act, a personal decision. And of course, it was an individual act, as he, you know, as he explained. But I don't think it was really personal. I think it went beyond personal. I think when you hear him talking about being fed up with you know, and this is this quote from him, black bodies lying in the streets, police murdering black people getting paid lead, leave, um, which is really the Black Lives Matter. This is, he's, you can tell he's been very much influenced by the Black Lives Matter movement. He's an extension of that movement because this is what the Black Lives Matter movement has been fighting for, especially over the last two years. And he could have easily gone to one of their protests, and maybe he has. I have no idea. Um, maybe he has gone to protest in the Bay Area. Uh, you know, um, maybe that will come out later on. Um, but due to his popularity, due to him being a high profile athlete, what he has done for the last three pre-game, pre-season games is really to carry out a political act of rebellion by thumbing his nose against the most sacred of all songs <laughs> in the U.S., the national anthem. He just thumbed his nose at it. And he did this in the most unapologetic way. Why he did it and that he, that he plans to do it again and again until real change is made. Now what he means by real, real change, you know, we have to see what, what that is. Um, 
But there's no doubt that he weighed so many of the consequences that his actions would unleash. A racist, jingoistic, reactionary backlash, which it has caused. And it also included a, a horrible letter from the San Francisco Police Association that issued a letter to the NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell and the 49ers CEO Jed York demanding that Colin apologize for his quote foolish statements. And, and it goes, it's much, much more, but that's all you have to really know. Um, <laughs> many, you can read it online, many opponents have attempted to divert attention away from his message by attacking the tactic saying it was disrespectful to, to veterans and active duty soldiers, when really in reality Colin is asking people to question what this country is really all about, not the absurd notion that the U.S. is the quote greatest country on earth, which you hear a lot of the especially sports commentators talking about. This was a political act of rebellion done on the biggest stage, which is, and if you see it, if you've ever seen a NFL game, I'm, some of you probably have, it is the most militarized um, spectacle you can even imagine. It opens up with a military honor guard, that's bad enough, you know, with the national anthem, but it has jet fighter planes oh, yeah. flying over every game. Every game in the NFL, you see fl uh, j jet fly uh, uh, fighter planes flying over, the Blue Angels, it is so horrible. And you know, there's other uh, professional teams and even college that do the same thing. But the NFL, it's, it's, it's right up, it's, it's the worst, I think. It really is the worst. Um, but it's interesting, it sort of has had a, had a flip um, side to it. And that is on Saturday, what was August 28th? It was Saturday or Sunday? A black GI started a hashtag called Veterans for Kaepernick. This one GI. <laughs> And a night before last, it was the number one trend on Twitter in the whole world. They're, they're saying like 400,000, there were 400,000 tweets wow. that came out of this one, you know, um, you know this, this uh, hashtag. And it was just amazing. You could just spend hours and hours just going through these tweets and, you know, black GIs, you know, holding you know, veterans for Kaepernick. I'm black first, I'm a GI second, I, I suffer or I've suffered horrible racism in the military. And they show their pictures. Some of them are in combat gear. <laughs> veterans for <laughs> Kaepernick. I, you know, I didn't, you know they, they're, they're saying that I, want to, I defend the Constitution, it's your right to do this. I'm not defending the song. You know, I'm not over, you know, it's, it's just a very interesting to see the, some of the consciousness of some of these these veterans and active GI, you know, soldiers. Um, so, because they were using, see the bourgeoisie, they were using the whole issue, as you could see, that, oh, you're bashing the military when you're dishonoring the anthem, when you're dishonoring the flag. And so that was the main argument that they had against uh, Colin. But when that didn't work, <laughs> Then they had to come up with something else. And let me just say that another thing that the GIs talked about, they used it as a platform. They were thanking Colin, thank you for this platform. Because I've been wanting to talk about these issues. Like, for instance, the fact that there are 22 GIs a, a day, or veterans a day, who commit suicide in this country. That came out over and over again because of the lack of jobs and, you know, and health care and homelessness. Um, it was, it was, you know, hopefully other people can talk about this. But the other thing that has come out about what Colin did is the origins of the national anthem, uh, which was exposed by what he did. There is a, a very interesting, there are two interesting articles about the, the pro-slavery roots of the Star Spangled Banner. One is called Star Spangled Bigotry. The racist, 
The Hidden Racist History of the National Anthem, which is really worth reading. Uh, it exposes who Francis Scott Keyes was, you know, he owned slaves and, and so forth. And uh, the third stanza of the anthem, which is, you know, uh, it, it, it reflects a, um, uh, a battle that took place between Keyes forces and this black reg this regiment of free black people who are fighting, you know, this is during the British, the War of uh, 1812, and how he was calling for their massacre. You know, he was applauding the massacre of these, of these uh, soldiers. Uh, and then the other one is, Colin Kaepernick is writer than you know, the national anthem is a celebration of slavery. And he actually calls for the banning this person, uh, John Schwartz, calls for the banning of the national anthem. So these are, you know, some of the things that have come out. Um, also, uh, there's two more points. It came out today that Kaepernick wore socks during a practice game showing the police as pigs, <laughs> which is very reminiscent of the Black Panther Party. We use, it's there. And he, he said, yes, I wore them. I wore them, you know, before I took, did the protest. He explained, he, he wasn't apologetic about it. He said, this is the time period in which I, you know, wore them and that's it. <laughs> I mean, you know, so um, anyway, so, the, the, so now they're trying to attack him for that, that he's calling the police pigs, um, which is great. Um, and then the last point, is on the t-shirt that he wore. He wore a Fidel Castro Malcolm X t-shirt um, depicting the meeting that took place in 1960 when Fidel met Malcolm at the Hotel Teresa in, in Harlem uh, when he was, you know, ostracized by the U.S. government. And a lot of the commentators, in, 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 including, um, you know, Cuban you know, Guisanos, uh, they've attacked him for that. Uh, they're calling him dumb and, quote, dumb and ignorant, end quote, for wearing a T-shirt promoting a, quote, dictator of the most oppressive regime, quote, end quote, in the world. <laughs> I, had to, I had to respond on Twitter and say, you know, like, <laughs> um, I said this was a political act. He is, not, he is not dumb or ignorant. He did this for a reason. Because he has said that I don't do anything without knowing what I'm doing. I read, I study. He's made that very, very clear. He wore that t-shirt for a reason. <laughs> and uh, we can only speculate, you know, we can only speculate what he knows, or what he doesn't know about Fidel and the Cuban Revolution. It's not up to us to sort of speculate on, you know, on how he feels about these things. Um, but I have a feeling that he's, you know, he's, he's a rebellion, to me, he's a rebellious, you know, young person who, he, he, you know, who wants to see change. And he wants to push the envelope in order to do that. And um, so anyway, I just, and also I hope we get to, talk about this whole thing about what does it mean to be patriotic and a patriot and so forth because there's a lot of discussion about what that means and, and for the soldiers and the veterans that it means you know a lot of them who are for Colin it means that they defend his right to protest whether they agree with him or not and they've made that clear but what do we mean <laughs> you know what does it mean for revolutionaries and Marxists in terms of patriots when it comes to this country is a, you know, a, a different story. So we, hopefully we can get into that. But um, I'm going to end with this, comrades, that I, I think that this is a tremendous development uh, for our movement because it opens up so many doors. It opens up, uh, you know, a lot of discussion. It'll be very interesting to see how the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, continue, you know, how they um, view this development. In San Francisco yesterday, there was a press conference that was held uh, by, you know, anti-police brutality um, uh, groups at the San Francisco Police Department who were in support of Colin Kaepernick, who were, 
uh, exposing the police for the police murders in San Francisco, like you know Mario Woods especially. And then today there was this tremendous demonstration um, of the University of California, San Francisco. It's, it's a coalition called uh, Do No Harm Coalition. It's interns and nurses and students who were in the streets defending Colin Kaepernick. It was hundreds of them in wheelchairs and, and so forth. Mario Wood signs, a beautiful open letter you know, to Colin with all these interns and nurses signing it. Um, it was really, you know, it's all on uh, Facebook and on Twitter. Um, so really, what Colin's actions had sparked, uh, to quote him, in terms of this is bigger than football, and it's true. It's really true. This is bigger than football. It is bigger than just one individual, even if that individual is a high-profile athlete. Uh, Colin reflects the Black Lives Matter struggle, but I also think that um, just as you know, the Black Lives Matter movement isn't stagnant, I think he's also evolving as well. Uh, he can't help but evolve. Um, because look at all of the issues his protest is bringing to the surface. The, the racist war on black and brown people, the military, Cuba, and much more. He's not separated from the Black Lives Matter movement, but a big visible part of the movement, whether he plays an organizational role or not. That is his decision. But we, again, we need to emphasize, just as we say that we can't allow the Black Lives Matter movement to be isolated, to be ostracized by the government and the racist state, we also can't allow him to be isolated uh, and demonized um, by the state, which is what they're trying to do. So. I think we're all proud of him, just as, as we were proud of what John Carlos and Tommy Smith and Muhammad Ali were doing. And I think if Muhammad Ali was alive today and healthy, he would be right there <laughs> supporting Colin Kaepernick. So just about Standing Rock, yes, we do need to pay, you know, keep monitoring this situation too, because as comrades have said, there's been solidarity you know, groups going out there to, you know, to show support for this tremendous struggle. And, um, you know, I don't know whether we can do something here, you know, in terms of September 3rd through the 17th. We may want to, you know, think about, think about that, if there's any other solidarity actions taking place around the country in solidarity with Standing Rock. Because even in terms of police brutality, indigenous people, have been killed in huge disproportionate numbers by the police yes. and dying in jail, in custody. Women, yes. quite a few women, indigenous women have died at the hands you know, of the police and in, in jail. So anyway, it's something we have to really you know, continue to um, you know, bring as much um, publicity you know, to what's going on with indigenous people who, are st who still have the highest rate of unemployment and alcoholism and homeless, you know, just, it's just a horrifying situation for indigenous people along with, you know, calling for the, um, the freedom of Leonard Peltier as well, who is not doing, who's ill, you know, who um, has been ill for a long time after being in jail for almost 40 years. So anyway, just wanted to, to say that. Just a few more things about Colin Kaepernick. Um, and it's Cap Kaepernick. Kaepernick for those. Uh, it's, it's, a very, it's a very unusual name. Um, but even, you know, it, it has brought out so many important issues, including, you know, and it's so unfortunate that the issue of his identity has even come, been come, has come into question. And, um, and of course, you know, in terms of who goes to these games uh, and they take place, even though the, the names of the teams are like Detroit Lions and, you know, uh, which used to be, you know, uh, in terms of a thriving black city, you know, these games are not played in this, the cities that have these names. In other words, you know, they're in the white suburbs. 
you know, uh, um, I can't remember all the names, but but they're you, you know the, uh, the New England Patriots, which is a horrible team. They used to be in Boston, but they're not in Boston anymore. They're out in you know, in the suburbs somewhere, and so it's mainly white, of you know people who can afford these tickets who go and see these black athletes. The NFL, like many other, like the basketball NBA, the National Basketball Association, is over seventy percent black. But you, but that's not reflected in the stands, and so again, like I saw one um, uh, when Colin was explaining about you know wearing the socks with the with with the you know police pigs on them, this one guy said, "Just shut the fuck up and go out and play." You know that's what you that's what you're getting paid for. I don't want to hear anything. You just go out. And, I mean, just it was more horrible than that. You know, I, or I help you get you know, injured, playing, you know, all this, it's just horrific stuff, you know, coming from some, some of the fans. But even some of the, the black commentators and analysts have come out and said, oh, he's not quote unquote black enough, you know? I, you, know I, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's a very complex situation because of the oppression of black people and so forth, and a lot of the internal, it's a lot of internal stuff that goes on, but it's been brought out on social media, um, because he is from mixed, you know, he's biracial, even though he's he's black, but his mother his mother is white. So even some of the black commentators have had to apologize, especially since he's talked about how he has, you know, how he's you know been a victim of police brutality, you know, himself. So anyway, these are it's just. It's just, a, you know, all these different issues that are coming out, but I wanted to get to the issue what Larry said about monitoring the situation. Because really the main attacks are coming from the top. They're coming from the police, but they're also coming from, you know, Colin Kaepernick could lose his job because the way he timed it is very, it's, it is very important. He timed this during the preseason. His, his uh, quarterback position is on the line. Yes. It's on the line. And so the way he timed it, it's like, well, if they, if they get rid of him, then how is that, you know, how does that make the 49ers look in the NFL? But then there's this whole issue of, well, how is he going to perform and this and that because he's been hurt over the last couple of years. You know, how are the fans going to feel about it? So anyway, it's, it's a very... Um, it's walking a sort of a fine line right now in terms of what's going to happen to him. But, you know, let's, you know, let's be clear. This is mainly coming from the top, and the top executives of the NFL, they're scared about this. For one thing, and this, a lot of people didn't know until he, you know, uh, carried out this act. You are not obligated, under the NFL rules, you are not obligated to stand for the, play, for the, uh, for the anthem. You're not obligated. You're not obligated with baseball, professional baseball, or even hockey. The only uh, sports, pro sports arena that you are obligated to stand with your hand over your heart is the National Basketball Association. Okay. No. It's the only one. Not the NFL, not the hockey, not Major League Baseball. You are not obligated to stand. Doing it, they encourage you to do it, they say, but you are not legally obligated. So he was well in his rights, but just from that standpoint, not to stand, you know, for the national anthem. However, this, ar this article came out, uh, when did it come out? Um, yesterday. Colin Kaep this is the headline. Colin Kaepernick branded a, quote, traitor by NFL executives over anthem protests. None of them gave their names. But they're saying stuff like, I don't want him near my, anywhere near my team. One front executive, office uh, executive said of Kaepernick, he's a traitor. He has no respect for our country. Fuck that guy. This is from, um, in my career, this one general manager told um, who's Freeman? Oh, Fr Mike Freeman from the Bleacher Report, which is a very you know popular online uh, s s um, uh, you know magazine online. 
So in my career, I have never seen a guy so hated by front office guys as Kaepernick. So anyway, um, so we really do have to monitor this because they hate him. They hate him for what he has done because as Larry was saying, they're afraid of this spreading. Just, just a few nights ago, a young uh, rookie from the Philadelphia F uh, Eagles had come out and said, I'm going to stand with Kaepernick. I want to protest with him. Uh, the problem is, is that he announced it <laughs> two days before he was going to do it, and then he was forced to back down because he's a rookie. He's, he's, he's fighting for a contract. He's not established like someone like Colin Kaepernick. So he decided, well, I am going to stand, you know. But he came out, and I mean, you know, can, can you imagine, you know? Um, other players coming out in solidarity with what he's doing, because you know a lot of them want to do it. Yeah. They really do want to do it. But they really are afraid and, and so forth. But who knows? <laughs> you know, if, if he gets one or two more, and especially if they do try to get rid of him, you know, along with people not in the NFL, not in the sports world, coming out in mass, you know, supporting him, what the other players may do, because uh, the history of this in terms, especially after Ferguson, is that the St. Louis Rams uh, defensive backs came out with their hands up. They got ostracized oh, yeah. by the St. Louis police for doing that, just for having their hands up. This is after the Ferguson re Rebellion. And the basketball, well, the basketball players didn't get, the it's, or, or the women, yes. Well, the women came out after Al Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. When they want, wore the shirts, now they, they sort of compromised a little bit because they also put the Dallas police logo on there. But you know, but they were still ostracized. They were they were they were threatened with with fines as individuals. Their teams were threatened. But because of the mass support from below, especially because of the Black Lives Matter movement, they were forced. The hierarchy of the WNBA was forced to rescind those fines. So, but the NFL is another, th is a whole other thing, comrades, because of the military, yeah, they have a players association. They do have a players association. Um, I, I don't think they've come out on anything on Colin. Oh, I thought they, I saw something on Facebook that they said that they, they, they would support him? Okay. Okay, they would defend him. It hasn't, been, okay, it hasn't got that much publicity. But anyway, we do have to monitor the situation because this is, this is really, really big because of what, you know, because of what he's done and the fact that he has embarrassed, he really has embarrassed the U.S., you know, in terms of what he, what he did. <laughs> and so, um, so they're really, really worried about it. So, you know, we'll just continue to, to monitor the situation and show as much solidarity as we, we can with him, depending on what happens. Um, we'll see what happens tonight and beyond. And um, so, anyway, to be continued. Yeah.